Join us this new year for new conversations at the Commonwealth Club. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's online event at the Commonwealth Club of California. And yes, I meant to say good morning. It's just much more pleasant. I'm trying to get us into a, a peppy mood for what could be a very heavy discussion. I'm actually hoping it is. I'm Otis R. Taylor Jr., the managing editor of KQED News and the former East Bay columnist for the San Francisco Chronicle. It is my pleasure to introduce my guests, the co-authors of The Riders Come Out at Night, Brutality, Corruption, and Cover-Up in Oakland. It is a riveting and profound portrait of out-of-control policing in Oakland. It is also a history lesson in American policing. It is an authoritative look at why police reform is so slow and why some might argue police reform is impossible. Darwin Bongram is the news editor of the Oakland side, and Allie Winston is an independent journalist. Both have done extensive and consequential reporting in Oakland for years. Welcome, Allie and Darwin. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. I'm so glad to be here with you. Uh, the killings of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and the mass protests that followed opened many Americans' eyes to cases of police brutality and misconduct. But two decades earlier, a civil rights lawsuit against Oakland police brought some of those same issues into focus. The suit alleged that a band of rogue Veteran police officers, known as the Riders, beat, kidnapped, and planted drugs on Black Oaklanders. A 2003 settlement led to the federal monitoring of the Oakland Police Department, which continues today. In their new book, Ali and Darwin explore the fallout from the trial of the Riders and why some promised reforms have failed. Over the next hour, we'll hear uh, about some of that reporting and what it reveals about the racist history of policing in the Bay Area and the United States. Now, if you'd like to ask a question, please post it in the YouTube live chat, which is to the right of your screen, and I'll get to as many as I can later in the program. All right, Darwin, Ali, let's set the stage. It was the summer of 2000 when Keith Batt, a rookie cop, doing his field training, saw officers beating up people, writing false police reports or falsifying police reports, planting drugs. I mean, the images you painted reminded me of training day, uh, while patrolling West Oakland, an area where Black people and people of color have been relegated to live through government-sanctioned segregation. Now, charges were brought, and the officers weren't convicted, unsurprisingly. One still has yet to face justice, as you go into a great deal about it. I'll, I'll let you explain why that is. But that case led to a civil rights lawsuit and a consent decree to build the reform program monitored by a federal judge. But now, 23 years later, OPD is still being monitored. Monitored. I want to know from both of you, what does that say about reform in Oakland and America? That's a great question, Otis. Um, first off, thank you for everybody who's watching. Um, we do appreciate your attention on this topic. The One of the biggest reasons why we wanted to write this book is that in our you know, decade plus 20 something years combined of reporting on Oakland, 
we, the consent decree, the reform program implemented by a federal court and that basically outlined a series of reforms to the department's internal affairs processes, internal discipline program, uh, monitoring programs for officers to make sure they didn't get into problematic behavior. It really was about, th this case is one of the furthest, it's one of the longest, it is the longest case of police reform in the country. It's the longest running consent decree. Um, it's outlasted similar cities um, with similar programs like Los Angeles and Washington DC and Pittsburgh. And in many ways to us, and to quite a number of experts that we spoke to, it represents kind of the edge case in law enforcement. It pushes the limits of reform. It shows, you know, it questions the possibility of whether or not this program, that a consent decree, which is a very legalistic, technical uh, method that is also used not just to reform police departments, but also other problem institutions such as prisons, mental health institutions, hospitals, and so on, school boards, it brings into question whether this is actually a sustainable and feasible way of, of bringing law enforcement into constitutional, um, the realm of constitutional policing for every citizen, regardless of race, creed, or color. So it's it really kind of pushed our reporting into some places that we didn't really expect it. Yeah, to your question, um, when we set out to write this book, we were sort of asking ourselves, uh, you know, if we're going to spend so much time diving into Oakland, we've got to figure out some of the things that are unique about the city and, and the city's police reform efforts, and then figure out also like how that, um, what, what sort of lessons that might, um, people might take from that, uh, living in other cities, other parts of the country. Um, and one thing that jumped out at us early on was that was the idea that it's probably true that more has been done in Oakland over many decades to try to reform policing than probably any other city in the United States. And that goes back, you know, to the 19, uh, 1990s when um, there were groups like Pueblo um, challenging uh, police oversight in Oakland, the 1980s and 70s when the first civilian police review board was set up there to the 60s when the Black Panther Party was confronting the police in the streets, to the 50s, to the 40s when the Civil Rights uh, Congress and radical labor attorneys were uniting with Black West Oaklanders to challenge policing, and even before that to some extent. And so we thought, you know, if more has been done in Oakland to try to transform policing uh, and the police department is still experiencing such uh, difficulties as it is, what does that say about policing in America? And that's kind of one of the early things we took away when we set out to write this book. Now, Lodoris Cordell, um, the first Black woman judge in the state of California, said there's only one thing wrong with the criminal justice system. That's justice. Now, Darwin, there is a police officer who has evaded justice in, uh, or even having his day in court with the writers. Can you tell us about um, how this group that wants people to be held accountable and you have this officer who has skirted accountability for uh, more than two decades. Yeah, the officer you're referring to is Frank Vasquez. Um, Vasquez was born in Mexico, but came to the United States at a young age, became an Oakland police officer. Um, his nickname on the streets was Choker because he was known to grab people by their neck and shake them really hard, especially when he suspected people had drugs in their mouth. And so he would just sort of manhandle their face and choke them. Um, Vasquez was well known in Oakland's black community. Um, the writer's scandal happened in 2000. So this was Frank Vasquez and several other officers riding around West Oakland and uh, beating up people, planting drugs on them. Uh, fight, uh, writing false police reports and engaging in a bunch of other criminal activity. But Vasquez, um, according to documents and interviews that we did, had been engaged in this kind of behavior all the way back in the mid 1990s in East Oakland, where he was known to be abusing people. D when the writers were um, brought to trial 
in late 2000, Vasquez was uh, a no-show in court. He was last seen by um, a, a couple police officers in a small city north of um, Oakland, out sort of toward the Central Valley where he lived. He was driving in a car. He had a rifle in the back seat. He had a, another gun on him. And he sort of badged his way out of this encounter by saying, I'm an Oakland police officer. You know, you got to let me go. And these officers let him drive off. He was never seen again. The FBI, uh, you know, ran a fugitive operation to try to bring him to justice, but he never faced trial and no one to this day knows where he is. That's interesting. We're going to get back to the book, but I just want to sidebar real quick. Uh, what the heck is going on with the Oakland's police chief? As you, you know, anyone who's followed Oakland and policing, you know, there's been trouble keeping a chief around uh, for a while. But I want to quote um, you, Darwin, from a story you published in the Oakland side. Uh, you reported that Armstrong was placed on administrative leave by Mayor Sheng Tao last week following the publication of a report that blamed him for a breakdown of the discipline process in a police misconduct case involving a sergeant who was in a hit and run car crash and other questionable incidents. Darwin, we have uh, this department under a consent decree as I I Ali was telling us, it's probably the longest ever. How is this not a problem? How is uh, Armstrong holding a rally to get his job back or to be reinstated when you're not holding your officers accountable? Tell us what's happening here. It's a really complicated situation. And at this point in time, uh, the public and even members of the press, we don't have all the information we actually need to really come to a conclusion here. But um, one thing I'll say is that the reason we know about this strange set of internal affairs cases involving this sergeant who crashed crashed his car, ripped a bumper off another car, and then later shot the wall of an elevator with his gun. And it looks like the internal affairs commander um, played played favorites and reduced discipline for this sergeant. Instead of firing him, they let him stay on the force with just counseling as a punishment because he's popular politically in the community. Um, it looks like Armstrong may have gone along with that in an improper way, but we don't really know if that's true yet because there's a lot of evidence and information that the public hasn't been able to see yet. Um, but what what I do want to underscore is that in in an average police department, and that there's about eighteen thousand law enforcement agencies in the United States, right? We're a we're a federalized country. There's state police agencies, sheriffs departments, city municipal police departments, transit agency police departments. Eighteen thousand police agencies in the United States. The vast, vast majority of which are not under federal oversight or a consent decree. These kinds of things happen and you never hear about them. The reason we know this is going on in Oakland right now is precisely because Oakland is under one of the most intense forms of scrutiny of any police department in America. The federal oversight due to the consent decree that was put in place. Uh, as a result of the Riders scandal in the year 2000. And that's the only reason we can talk about right now this really strange and sort of tragic um, news that we're seeing coming out of the police department right now with the, with the police chief on leave accused of misconduct. And if I may, I think that it's worthwhile emphasizing that Chief, that chief Armstrong being put on administrative leave is a bit of a distraction from the real issue. And that real issue here is that a senior supervisor in Oakland's Internal Affairs Division, a captain, I believe, um, changed the, basically interfered in the investigations into Sergeant Michael Chung's alleged misconduct. And that goes entirely against both the spirit and the letter of the consent decree. Um, part of the reason why it, a judge found it necessary in 2003 to impose a consent decree on the city of Oakland as a result of the Riders case is that so many complaints about those officers, Frank Vasquez, Chuck Mavanag, Matt Hornung, and Jude Siapno, 
had not been properly addressed by the Internal Affairs Division. It was a serious failing within the Department of the Accountability Process. That's the issue in Oakland. It keeps happening again and again and again. Darwin and I detail this ad nauseum in riders over the past 20 years. The consent decree has been extended. It was supposed to last five years. It's worthwhile remembering. And it's been extended at least three times. And it probably, it looks like there's a very good chance it might get extended again. So it's not so much about the chief of police, although he does potentially have a role here. It's about the underlying misconduct. And that's the real bear in the room. And unfortunately, some of the remarks that I've seen over the past few days about, oh, we need to take our police department back from this judge and so on, doesn't work like that. Not at all. And, um, you know, the years I spent uh, writing about policing, it was it became clear to me that as a citizen, I cannot count on the police to police the police. They just can't do it. They will have their foot on a lever. Speaking about policing, I understand that many in this country uh, nak nakedly support the police. I mean, we have an entire political party that's back the blue and the police can't do any wrong. Um, those folks find the people like you two who dare question the police narrative journalists to be anti-American. To those folks, the police are the heroes. Well, it seems to me that if there's a hero in the writer's story, it's, it's Black uh, because he kept his pledge to uphold his oath to protect and serve. And he paid an incredible price for it. Uh, the police can be ruthless to whistleblowers. Um, I want to get it from both of you. I'm going to start with you, Ali. Just talk about just what your reporting um, surfaced about what um, Blatt faced um, by doing the right thing. Sure. So Keith Batt, when he initially joined the Oakland Police Department, he was a very idealistic young man. He wanted to, from Sebastopol, north of Oakland, a uh, much different sort of community. And he'd majored in criminal justice he, when he was in college. He wanted to be a police officer. He wanted to do well. And he also wanted to work in an active department. Uh, as your Northern California listeners um, will well know, Oakland is an active police department. It's a city with very real and deep-seated uh, public safety challenges and problems that stretch back decades. And when he witnessed the blatant you know, misconduct, the criminal activity of his field training officer, Chuck Mabinag, and the other officers on that he ran to in West Oakland who composed the riders. Um, by the way, not just the four charged in these criminal incidents, there were, there's a whole coterie of officers who kind of circulated around, who, you know, orbited Mabinag and Siapno and Hornug and Vasquez that we detail. So he basically had two weeks, less than two weeks on the job, and he had a crisis of conscious and wanted to quit, he confronted the riders. At one point, feared for his life during one of these conversations. He was calculating, you know, if I get into it with these guys and they want to hurt me, can I draw, can I fire on them in due time? And then how will it look for me explaining that, oh, I'm an on-duty, in-uniform Oakland cop who engaged in a shooting with a couple of others. That's the sort of calculus he was going in because he feared for his life so badly at that point. He was coaxed to by Mabinag to quit but instead of quitting, he walked upstairs in the police administrative building and told his entire story to an investigator. And that opened the can of worms and set in process the investigation that led to the administrative suspensions, firings, and then criminal charges of the riders. But he faced a very high price. Um, you know, Keith was at that point living in North Oakland and at one point, a friend of his overheard a couple other cops um, talking about him in the locker room after he turned in the riders and said, oh, you know, I know where he lives. Let's go by his house and do a project. Um, there were their slang term for like a special operation or so on. God knows what that meant, but he fled Oakland. He moved out um, on the advice of the internal affairs investigator. He initially spoke to John Matarang that carried a firearm illegally, even though you know, he said, what do I do about the, about the concealed weapon charge? And Matarang told him, you don't want to worry about that. You'd rather have to deal with that little legal problem rather than being six feet deep. Um, and, you know, Frank Vasquez had stolen a rifle from the police department, had fled justice. He was in the wind. No one knew where he was. Um, so there was always the possibility of that happening. Um, another officer, um, Hewison, who had also testified against the riders 
because he was coerced to through a subpoena, um, also experienced retaliation. He was called a rat, um, had graffiti, you know, menacing him. They went up in the locker room, in the bathroom, in OPD headquarters. Their stories, unfortunately, they're not unique to police whistleblowers. Um, there are others throughout history. Frank Serpico of the NYPD was famously, um, you know, other officers after he turned in a massive graft um, scheme in the NYPD in the mid 70s, he was um, denied backup on one call to a um, narcotics dealer's apartment, shot and left for dead. And he almost passed away. He's still alive to this day. Another NYPD cop in the 2010s who blew the whistle on um, illegal quotas, arrest quotas and stop quotas, Adrian Schoolcraft. He was involuntarily hospitalized by the NYPD to try and silence him. So in many ways, actually, police misconduct and this sort of, you know, wildly illegal um, culture of impunity and, you know, solidarity and, you know, thin blue line, it actually hurts police officers um, just as much as it hurts residents, you know, it really hurts the officers who want to do the right thing. Um, there's another officer in our book we mentioned who was actually killed in a friendly fire incident by two young officers, both of whom had had uh, issues with prior uses of forces, uses of force and shootings. And because they weren't brought in, brought under, um, under better supervision, uh, Willie Wilkins, an undercover Latino officer was killed, shot and killed on the street. Left for dead. And Darwin, um, just piggybacking on what Ali just said, um, you kept like, retaliation and the um, pressing and 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 wanting to uh, instill fear into a fellow officer. Uh, but what kept one of the themes, and there's many of the themes, and I'll, I'll bring up some more in your book, was that uh, the writers they they were retaliatory, and if you dare. Um, didn't do what they said, they would come back and, and they would make sure, or, um, you know, they would take you for a ride, literally. Um, talk about that um, aspect of, of how deep that was ingrained, um, not just in Oakland, but in policing in general. Yeah, the, the riders were of a generation of cops who in Oakland and beyond, they viewed their job as crime suppression and they felt that they needed to use whatever tools necessary to prevent criminal activity in the areas that they policed, um, the riders ended up adopting brutality as one of their main methods. And so, you know, I'll just quickly tell the story here of one individual um, to sort of underscore the point that they were more interested in um, the order part of law and order. And they were so, so law and order, right, is what the police are supposed to be about. They were more interested in the order portion of it than the law portion of it. And so they frequently used illegal methods to impose what they viewed as the proper order on West Oakland residents. And so in one particular case, in the summer of 2000, again, while Keith Batt, the whistleblower who's sort of in the center of the first couple chapters of our book, while he's on patrol with the riders, they're driving around West Oakland and they're in an unmarked minivan. They're doing a special operation. They spot a young man who's walking across the street late at night. Uh, this was Delphine Allen. And Frank Vasquez was in the van and he he decided that it was important that they stop Delphine Allen. So he ordered Keith Bat uh, and himself. They jumped out and they chased down Allen. Um, they arrested him. Uh, Delphine Allen knew who Frank Vasquez was. And so he got in a verbal altercation with Vasquez. Vasquez challenged Allen to a fight. Um, Allen didn't want to get beat up. So he uh, you know, told a passing, uh, a, another pedestrian, Hey, these guys are going to beat me up. That made Frank Vasquez very angry. Um, the police ended up sticking him in the back of a squad car. And after Alan became angry because he felt that drugs were planted on him, he started kicking the inside of the car. At that point, the officers pulled him out. They emptied a can of pepper spray into his mouth. They choked him. They punched him. They beat him up and they threw him back in the car. And what happened next was sort of the um, 
the, the what was what was done already was very illegal right they are they had already planted drugs on this individual falsely arrested him and used excessive force but the next thing that happened was two officers frank vasquez and jude siapno decided that they needed to really teach this young man a lesson so they allegedly kidnapped him drove him under a bridge in West Oakland, a freeway bridge where the sound of the cars above would have, would drown out any cries for help or anything. They pulled him out of the car and they beat him senseless, um, leaving him with a, a damaged eye and just bruises all over his body. Um, Alan was so afraid that later on when he was being processed for arrest at a gas station they had taken him to, he wouldn't tell the officer's sergeant, their supervisor, what really had happened. There were literally dozens of incidents similar to this, just inexcusable beatings of people by police officers during the roughly two weeks that Keith Batt was on the street. And again, it was all about these officers using brutality to impose what they believed was order upon a population of people who they didn't feel they needed to respect the constitution when they were interacting with them. I, I like that you mentioned law and order. Um, and another thing that kept uh, coming up as I'm reading these pages was the uh, criminalization of poverty and the dehumanization of the impoverished. Uh, it's as if the police and the riders, um, even after they were outed, uh, you know, had cover for their behavior because this is law and order. Uh, one thing that I really appreciated about this book is um, that you two didn't pull punches. You talked about or wrote about the tough on crime, get me some votes, please, Democrats, that supported this by looking the other way, by not stepping in and say, hey, there are people being tormented. And if we want to help them, maybe we should stop this. Uh, just speak a little bit um, for both of you, and we'll, we'll start with you, Darren, um, that strategy, and what were the conversations like between you two to uh, take on this liberal Bay Area where we think we're so progressive and post-racial, but um, you know, you exposed a, a problematic history. So yeah, uh, we'll start with you, Darren. Yeah. So again, the, you know, we begin the book in 2000. And at the time, um, someone that virtually every Californian is familiar with, Jerry Brown, was the mayor of Oakland. He had won the 1998 Oakland mayoral race um, after having been out of politics for quite some time. He had been a governor in the 70s and had a, you know, really stellar political career young, young uh, when he was uh, much younger in life. Um, and he was, you know, he was known as a, a kind of radical, progressive, um, iconoclast. Uh, just before he ran for mayor of Oakland, he had had a radio program on the, uh, you know, left wing uh, radio station KPFA. And he he initially ran for mayor on this platform of wanting to turn Oakland into a ecopolis, like a an ecotopian city of, you know, Mediterranean delights. Um, and as he went around Oakland talking to neighborhood groups, um, a lot of the a, a lot of the electorate started telling him their main concern was crime. And so he quickly um, threw out his like sort of green Democrat platform and adopted what was then kind of a mainstream Democratic Party program of we need to hire more cops and we need to allow them to use more aggressive tactics to combat violent crime in our communities. So when he became mayor, Brown was known to show up to the lineups um, of OPD officers as they were about to go on shift. Um, and he and the police chief and other supervisors at the time would tell, would tell the officers, go out there, hit the corners, make arrests, be aggressive, and we will back your play. Brown famously said he was going to make uh, Oakland safer than Walnut Creek, a, you know, overwhelmingly majority white suburb um, east of the city. 
uh, Brown had recruited Bill Bratton, the former New York City um, and Los Angeles Police Department chief, uh, to come in and advise him on his crime strategies. Um, and Brown repeatedly backed the police, even after the Ryder scandal broke, he was still um, of the mind that the police needed a freer hand to combat crime. He famously himself personally called the police to have a woman uh, who was um, in possession of drugs arrested outside of his building. And he also praised a vigilante who shot a young man in a North, North Oakland neighborhood. Brown represented the mainstream of the Democratic Party at the time. We were coming out of the mid 90s with, you know, the Clinton era kind of politics of passing the largest omnibus crime fighting bill in American history that had billions of dollars in it for the police to purchase high tech weaponry and to expand prisons across the country. That was the context back then. And also, it's worthwhile noting that the other layers of accountability that could have happened that you know exist on a state and federal level, which could have brought the riders into check, they at the point in time when the scandal broke, I believe the federal justice department was run was Bill Clinton's last couple last several months, and the justice department took no interest in opening a formal pattern and practice investigation. Normally consent decrees, pattern and practice investigations, for me to rewind a little bit, are the way by which the Federal Department of Justice initiates its civil rights investigations into abusive policing. Once an investigation establishes the pattern of, uh, the pattern of misconduct, then a either a, you know, a deputy att attorney general or a state prosecutor, because there are similar, similar laws throughout the US on state level, can file a request to a court for a consent decree. And then if a judge grants it, it goes into effect. The Clinton Justice Department, from people that we spoke to, had no interest in pursuing such a case. They were essentially dumping their files and getting ready for jobs in the private sector in the summer of 2000, the fall of 2000. Um, it's also worthwhile noting that former U.S. Attorney Robert Mueller, who's not a Democrat, but was the sitting U.S. Attorney at the time, um, declined to pursue criminal cases against the riders, even though the investigating Alameda County Deputy District Attorneys, um, the ADA, excuse me, Assistant District Attorneys, were cross-designated as U.S. Attorneys at the time. And the feds could see the entire file. And they didn't choose to pursue this because, you know, you're weighing the evidence of the word and evidence of police officers who have good reputations in the department, so-called, versus people from the street who many of whom had extensive rap sheets. And that you know, was a different calculus in 2000 than it is today in 2023. Similar cases have been filed. Um, the federal prosecution of rogue Baltimore police officers um, in the gun uh, trace task force case a few years back is a great example of that. But also the state attorney general didn't take action. Um, throughout OPD's history, Oakland continued to be run by Democratic mayors and councils. Um, those city councils and mayors to various degrees did and didn't, uh, they mostly were ineffective at pushing forward the reform program. Um, some of them actually oppose it openly and still do. They view it as outside interference um, and unnecessary meddling by the federal court that is only exists to enrich civil rights attorneys and the court monitor. It's a long standing argument that's been kind of rehashed in the past week or so. But it's worth also bringing into focus the inaction of the Alameda County DA in the future, uh, in the events following the riders. Um, very little, reper very few repercussions came about for OPD officers in the litany of cases that we document. The state attorney general also um, in the future under both Jerry Brown, um, he was attorney general from, I believe, 2008 through 2011 or 12 when he made his, uh, when he won the governorship again for the second time. They didn't do much and neither did the state AG under Kamala Harris, who's now the vice president. Um, in fact, there are some particular passages in the book where OPD makes a request of attorney general Harris to help them investigate police misconduct and they do not respond. So the uh, burden actually really, it, you know, the police officers on the street and their sergeants are one are at this level of accountability, but it really goes all the way up to the top of our political system. That's OK. We'll be getting to audience questions shortly, uh, so please put your questions or comments in the text chat um, and YouTube. 
I want to go back uh, six, seven years now, excuse me, change the calendar. Um, <clears throat> you two um, got me back into journalism in a way. Um, I was working in tech and uh, there was the scandal just coursing through Oakland Police Department. <clears throat> and uh, the San Francisco Chronicle uh, contacted me uh, to replace their, their columnist. And uh, when I interviewed in 2016, it was around the time that the East Bay Express was scooping all over the place, uh, doing some really deep reporting um, on the Bay Area police officers, including Oakland, police officers who were engaged in sex trafficking um, a young woman. Um, and that explo exploitation began in her teens. Uh, when I was asked during that interview process, uh, you know, what kind of uh, columnist I would be, I said, I want to compete with those guys. I was like, I want to be out in the streets, um, dropping scoops, holding um, the powerful to account. And I knew I couldn't do that to Oakland because that was that was your game. Um, but I found my own in Vallejo and just the, the same things that you have been reporting on, um, the, the racism, the brutality, the fatal shootings, um, that, you know, your, your coverage was really inspirational. But what I liked most about it as a journalist is that you two were relentless and um, you earned a George Polk Award for that kind of reporting. Uh, both of you, and I'll start with uh, you, Darwin, what the heck drives you to, um, you know, put your nose in there and to, uh, you know, around the clock be um, digging sources and um, following up on tips that many of them don't pan out, but then publishing stories that uh, really rocked uh, a police department. Yeah, I never, you know, I didn't set out to be a journalist. Um, I was in grad school um, for a number of years, and I thought I, thought I was going to become an academic. Um, but what was driving me in graduate school, and I, you know, I had the really good fortune of having a lot of professors and be, being around a number of students who really taught me a lot of stuff. Um, what drove me back then and, and the realizations I was having was that, you know, s some of the really worthwhile work that I could do in life was to contribute to um, a lot of these movements for justice in one way or another to, to build a more just society. Um, I initially thought I would do that as an academic researcher. Um, I ended up kind of stumbling into journalism in a number of ways. And um, I found that, you know, just by putting the truth out there, by digging beneath the surface, um, by exposing things that powerful people and institutions really don't want the public to know, um, that that could have um, a very beneficial impact on the ability of civil society to like grapple um, with these huge social problems, like, for example, the racism that especially Black people experience at the hands of law enforcement. Um, so yeah, I mean, if anything, you know, has driven me in, in this work, it's just, you know, a desire to make some kind of contribution uh, to that overall effort. Yeah. And uh, uh, Alex, before you go, I mm -hmm. want to say that Darwin is quite reserved you know, play the background. Ali, you are, <laughs> you are in, in faces, like you are, um, uh, you know, people will call it aggressive, but I just call it someone who wants answers and who thinks the public deserves it. So yeah, talk about that drive that you have, um, particularly when you're exposing corruption and misconduct um, that span the Bay Area, Bay Area police departments. Yeah. Um... So might, it might have something a little bit of something to do with my background. Um, I'm from back east. I'm, from, I'm a New Yorker. And it's where I grew up. It's where I first cut my teeth as a reporter. Um, I got my first job. My initial, I'm a little bit similar to Darwin, but I got kind of the push to go into journalism earlier. I was a history student as an undergrad in Chicago, and I was dealing with a lot of primary sources. I loved it. I really enjoyed the ability of being able to dive deep into archives. I had 
um, experience working for a, a journalist turned historian named Rick Atkinson, who's a remarkable, remarkable writer and researcher. And I saw up close how those research skills can be used to craft narratives of the past that inform the present. Um, and I just realized in my undergrad studies that, yeah, the, the his field of history is incredibly powerful. The tools are great. The ability to write narratives is fantastic, but there's a stricture on the field and it's that you really can't go beyond the past 20 years beforehand because the narrative isn't established. The archive isn't established. I think that's wrong. I think that there are major problems with the field, but that's just me. So as a result, I decided to write the primary sources instead of try and write the primary sources instead of mining them and doing my own research and waiting, you know, 15 years before I could do authoritative work. Um, so I started out as a reporter on the streets in Jersey City, which is a pretty um, rough and tumble place, Hudson County, New Jersey. People come from Colombia, from Medellin, Colombia, to study municipal corruption in northern New Jersey, for those of you not familiar with it. It's a very, very dynamic place. Um, it's a different type of news coverage. Um, you have to be more aggressive out there. People will lie to you. You have to call them out on it. Um, if you don't, they'll walk over you. So that's where I got my initial training. Um, and I'm not saying that folks in the West Coast don't know how to do it, but it's just a different, you, you get built differently as a reporter out there um, when you start out and you, or at least you did back then. I, I've seen some changes. Um, I think that the real reason why I want to do the work is to keep people accountable, to make sure certain that the institutions we build as a society don't end up harming us more than they do helping us. Uh, I think with the criminal justice system, it's very clear that the current system we have is broken, ha is harmful, has been harmful, and that there have been corrective attempts to, there have been attempts to rectify that damage. In California in particular, I think the state legislature has been working hard. Um, not, it's not a perfect endeavor, but they have been working hard to basically dismantle what um, a very famous sociologist once termed accurately the Golden Gulag, a state that birthed three strikes and you know a prison population that boomed to like 200% capacity at one point. But um, in terms of our styles, like if they do complement each other, um, I don't like I don't like being lied to. Um, I don't like it when institutions try and, and basically shine themselves off as paradigms. I think that it's an affront to the people who end up funding them. I think it's an affront to the people who work for them. And also, you know, this style of reporting over the years, I've developed God knows how many sources within these institutions and around them of all backgrounds. And really, if you don't try and pretend you're something that you're not, if you're just honest and show that you want to write an honest account of what's happening and portray the real issues as they're emerging at the time, people will come to you. You'll develop a reputation and people will realize that you're a straight arbiter of the facts. Um, and that I think is in the point in time when like so much journalism is being driven and kind of shaped by the dynamic of social media, which is a very, in my eyes, it's a great tool, but it's a corrupting influence. Um, that gets rarer and rarer. And it takes a lot of like very basic reporting of the sort that Darwin and I did like week in, week out for a long, long, long time. You know, uh, Darwin, you mentioned racism uh, within police departments and, uh, you know, uh, for the audience before we went on air, uh, but, you know, I wanted to ask this question and uh, seeing what happened in Vallejo where, you know, you have black people uh, disproportionately being fatally shot, you know, uh, disproportionate um, uh, representation in use of force cases, stop data. So what the city did was bring in a black police chief and um, they had a, a great ceremony, had the first uh, like three or four rows of um, city hall, um, the chambers reserved for black leaders in, in the community. And um, it was almost as a, okay, all right, Otis, we're, we're done. Like we've got the black guy here in charge. But what I found immediately was the rank and file was just outwardly opposed to any type of suggestions he had to improve the way they did policing from uh, uh, being transparent and producing uh, a, a dashboard that could be accessed publicly to actually trying to hold um, officers who had questionable questionable um, fatal shootings uh, accountable, trying to fire them. Uh, it just seems that uh, cities, uh, Little Rock, Arkansas, 
um, Oakland, San Francisco, um, you have uh, this representation of, hey, we're good because we have this black chief, but really what you've been writing about, reporting about for so long is the culture uh, of these police departments. What's your feelings on, on this kind of, um, let's dress this up and, and put these uh, black men and women in front of the camera as if that's going to solve um, what really ails these departments? Well, I, I think it does matter who is, is leading a police department and it, and it does matter who is leading a city, but your underlying point is true also that um, it's not enough to have a black police chief. And we see grave injustices committed against black people in cities where the leadership of the police department is African-American. And so how to explain the conundrum there? Um, in Oakland, you know, black political power truly came about in the 1970s. It had been, um, it had been stirring since the 1950s really, um, in the 1960s, the, the movements there, um, you know, helped build toward the election of Lionel Wilson as the city's first black mayor. Into the 1980s and 90s, we saw the city council become genuinely diverse. Um, African American and Latino and Asian members started getting elected um, to the city council. One, but this one of the ironies is that once the city became diverse and actually pe people, you know, the average person in the community felt like they were represented in city hall around that same time, we had the tax rebellion in California that gutted municipal budgets. And so um, and, and then by the 1980s, we had, you know, the rise of Ronald Reagan um, to become president, uh, the Reagan administration. Um, and then subsequent Republican and Democratic administrations gutted um, the federal budgets um, that were meant to assist cities. They um, got rid of the social programs that, um, you know, established in the 1930s and then also later in the 60s that were meant to alleviate poverty and address root causes of things that, for example, lead to crime amongst other social ills. Um, so, you know, you end up with a situation in which um, Black political leaders and police chiefs, um, even if they want to do the right thing, they may not have had the resources to do it. But then what you're also what you're also seeing is that, um, you know, it, it would be really insulting to say that the Black community is one thing or has one political ideology or the Latino community has one political ideology. Um, the white community in Oakland is not a monolith, um, just like every other community. And so you see these different factions. Um, and so, you know, there, there is a law and order faction within each of these communities. Um, and even within the departments themselves, um, you see a lot of different factions, but the, ma the main one is um, very resistant to change. And so like in the Oakland Police Department, which has diversified a lot um, since the 1970s, um, you see a department in which the majority of African-American officers uh, and Latino officers and Asian officers today will say that they don't feel, for example, that their race has anything to do with the unfairness of punishment within the department. Rather, it has to do with rank or something like that. And so you see how these um, the culture in within the Oakland Police Department, yeah, it is it is a lot like Vallejo and 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 what you experienced up there. There's a lot of resistance to change, and you can put in an African American leader, um, be it you know Shawnee Williams in Vallejo or Laron Armstrong in Oakland, and they can run up against a huge amount of um, uh, op uh, opposition to any reforms that they want to bring about. Yeah, I will say on the Vallejo, there's actually a very strong connection between the Vallejo Police Department's recent troubles in Oakland. Um, there was a officer, a very high ranking commander in Oakland, who in the mid 1990s, Robert Nicholini, um, he was in the running to replace uh, um, Chief Hart, who had been um, Oakland's police chief for almost 20, maybe running on 30 years. 
um, and held the department together through the period, a very, very intense period during the crack era in the 80s and 90s. Uh, when Nishalini didn't get the job, he moved to Vallejo and brought a lot of the old line methods from OPD to Vallejo. A lot of officers actually followed him and his son to Vallejo. And in the mid early 2010s, that's when you started to see Vallejo, VPD's shooting numbers shoot through the roof. Problems that were very similar to what Oakland had faced from basically the 2000s to maybe about 2013, 14, when the police shooting started to decrease. Um, so they're, they're interlinked, intertwined departments. Um, I just wanted to make that note. But in regard, with regard to like race and police chiefs and reform, so it really matters whether or not the police chief is committed to policing constitutionally or not. The race, honestly, I've seen in my time covering OPD, I have seen so many police chiefs since 2008. Anthony Batts and Laron Armstrong, both African-American chiefs, both chiefs who did not do enough apparently, um, especially given Laurent Armstrong to come into compliance with the consent decree. Uh, Anne Kirkpatrick, another chief under whom no progress, in fact, backsliding happened, a white chief um, under the consent decree. Sean Witt, who was in charge from 2013 through 2016 um, at White, not from Oakland, but he was the police chief, a former internal affairs investigator, who is responsible for the most progress made until the sexual exploitation scandal that led to his downfall. He attempted to cover it up and got in tremendous trouble. Um, probably could have been charged with obstruction of justice, but it's another example of Democrats punting when it comes to holding folks accountable. Um, just rewinding back, the police chief before the consent decree was implemented, the police chief who actually worked the hardest to change OPD's culture was Charles Gain, a white man born in Texas, a kind of Dust Bowl migrant who grew up in like, Oakland. Um, not wealthy, grew up in the flats, poor. Um, he was in charge from the 60, late 60s through, I want to say, 73 or 74. And he brought about a tremendous change in terms of how officers policed. He was not down with the sort of jackbooted, mid-century, hyper-racist policing, basically John Birch society in uniform, which OPD was to a certain extent. Uh, worked really hard to diversify the force, worked hard to bring in um, officer evaluations to make certain that they could they would be caught ahead of time for potentially you know problematic behavior and correct that without disciplinary process or ahead of it um, and you know he was forced out and eventually by the Oakland Police Officers Association the police union but he was very responsible for really changing OPD from basically a little LA you know little Parker era LAPD. Um, into something that was more modern and better reflected the community. So that's it's an important thing to keep in mind that this is not a binary when it comes down to race. Thank you for that. Uh, I wanna to get to some aud audience questions and Ali, I'm gonna give you this one since uh, Darwin, um, I wouldn't wanna ask him to give his opinion or to give advice, um, but I know Ali, you, you'll, you'll, you'll appreciate this one. Sure. Um, what advice would you give to um, Shang Tao and uh, Pamela Price, uh, two uh, women of color in new positions um, uh, on how to go about implementing meaningful and lasting criminal justice reform. Be transparent. Be, you have to be transparent. What we've seen in the past 15 years, uh, the kind of running saga about accountability and law enforcement in the East Bay has been, the real obstacle has been transparency and cover up and a lack of accountability. Um, at one point, it was the inability of the public to actually review misconduct files from officers and understand which officers were posing the biggest threat, not just to the community, but also other officers. Um, it would, I mean, all these issues that we, a lot of the issues that we flesh out from the period of like 2003 through 2018 came about because of lawsuits and complaints filed um, outside of the police department and people really going public with their issues. With regards to the district attorney's office, oftentimes in Alameda County, it's been a bit of a black box and uh, there hasn't been a great amount of interface with the public. Um, and I think that that has to change. And with regard to the mayor, don't let things fester. Um, get out in front of whatever issue you have, try and be as transparent as possible. And I guess, uh, I mean, the cover up is oftentimes worse than the crime. It's not saying it's always the case, but quite often, um, in, in terms of the Michael Chung case right now that Chief Armstrong is on admin leave for, it's the cover up. 
uh, and we haven't even gotten to police unions. Uh, we won't be able to get to that. Uh, but Darwin, uh, your reporting over the years has not reflected well on OPD. Um, does it make it harder for you to report on a department? Um, you know, how responsive is the department to your questions and your document requests? Yeah, I've been, you know, very critical of OPD over the years. Um, I've also written quite positive reports about the department and officers um, involved there. I've written reports about, you know, uh, when when OPD does succeed in reforming itself, which I think is something, um, you know, our, our book is uh, a, just sort of a laundry list of failures, right, of the police department to reform itself, of the political leadership in the city to take reform seriously. But um, we do include in a few chapters um, discussions about things that, ha that have worked over the years. And, uh, you know, I hope when people read it that one of the takeaways they, they get is that actually, in a way, reform has worked in Oakland. This is a vastly different police agency than it was 20 years ago. Um, I'm not going to list all the ways in which they've improved, but they kill far fewer people in these quote unquote officer involved shootings. Now that's a big deal. Just the fact that they're harming fewer people in the community. Um, they collect racial stop data, um, to an extent that no other police department does. And they engage with university researchers to analyze that data and figure out how they can reduce racial profiling by officers. They've done all sorts of stuff that actually deserves to be um, upheld as, you know, a model of reform. All that said, um, you know, journalism, it, it, the accountability portion of it is really critical. And when a department has problems like Oakland does, and probably, you know, most many large police departments have these problems, it's important to expose those things so that there can be like a thorough public discussion of it. Um, yeah, you know, I, I don't think Ali or I have like lost, you know, sources or an ability to report on Never. this stuff. If anything, it gets easier because there are actually a lot of police officers who want critical coverage of the department. They, they want the public to know about the deep dysfunctions and the political games that are played within their department and the ways that the department's policies fail the public and officers. And, you know, those those people will continue reaching out to reporters like us who, yeah, like, you know, a lot of police officers think that we're, you know, horribly biased and can't give officers a fair shake in our reporting. Um, that is not true. You know, if there's positive stories to be told about policing, uh, we'll tell them, uh, you know, but yeah, a lot of people, a lot of officers and people within the city know that the, these problems are extremely serious and need to be discussed. And they're, they're constantly, they're constantly calling us. I have uh, time for two more questions. I want to get to them both. Um, but you know, uh, uh, talking about transparency and these these self-inflicted wounds, um, uh, and then you know trying to cover up things. Um, one um, viewer asks, um, either of you who, who wants to take it, uh, please comment on the recent scandals in Berkeley policing, particularly the whistleblower count of anti-homeless and racist policing and arrest quotas. Um, whoever wants to jump on it, let's take it. Yeah. Go ahead, Doris. Not, yeah, not, not surprised at all to see, you know, a police union official in Berkeley accused of making those kind of comments. Um, if you look on social media, and it, it's less common now because more officers are becoming wise to the fact that they shouldn't say what they really think on social media, but for many years, if you looked on social media and you found the accounts of police officers, you would see these kinds of opinions shared in like quasi public spaces. And so to see an officer saying something that's like, you know, anti homeless or, um, you know, some other thing that, you know, shows a kind of like bias or view that's inappropriate to being a police officer to see them saying it in like text threads with uh, their own officer, you know, friends that they don't think are ever going to see the light of day is totally unsurprising. The Oakland Police Department, you know, just just, you know, a year ago had like uh, a year and a half ago had this big scandal around a former officer 
who was fired for uh, for killing a homeless man. Uh, and this officer set up an Instagram account that proceeded to share homophobic and racist and sexist messaging through memes. And it shared messages that like were to that totally undermined the very notions of um, the reforms that the negotiated settlement agreement were trying to get at. Um, that Instagram account was pretty popular. A lot of Oakland officers were actually following it. Um, so it, it's not surprising at all to see that that's, you know, also in Berkeley. Yeah, with regard to Berkeley, uh, I think it's worthwhile pointing out the city's not as liberal as people think it is. Um, there have been long been problems with uh, African Americans being stopped at wildly disproportionate rates in Berkeley to any other racial group um, with re without regard to, you know, how successful those seizures are. There have been reports in the past about excessive force used by BPD against uh, various communities, uh, certainly on campus, there have been a lot of clashes with them. The difference is that Oakland has a, there is a relatively large cache of people in Berkeley. There's a large constituency that actually supports this stuff. Um, I'm not saying they support unconstitutional policing, but they su certainly support keeping their city safe. Um, it has a lot of hostile architecture. There are many streets that dead end. Um, it's basically designed in a way to keep only certain points of access open into the city. Um, San Francisco has a similar thing with regard to homeless populations. There's a much more aggressive approach towards homelessness there, um, which did exist in Oakland in the Jerry Brown era. Uh, the riders actually, a couple of them were involved in kidnapping several homeless uh, folks from downtown and dropping them off in a different part of the city in a program that they dubbed um, tongue in cheek, beat and release. Um, so they would go out and do this stuff on their own and that sort of behavior. I'm not saying they're, they're kidnapping people in Berkeley and San Francisco, but they certainly are clearing them and pushing the edge of policing right up to the constitutional limits in terms of what they are doing. Okay, I have four minutes left. Two-parter question. First part, yes or no. Second part is, you'll see. Do you think the hiring for both of you of Michelle Phillips uh, as the Oakland Police Commission's first inspector general will speed up the pace of reform? Or should we be thinking about another avenue to address the culture of corruption, racial profiling, and violence that seems inherent to institution uh, policing? Ali, I'll go for you first. One minute. No, and that's for not because of the individual in question. I think that that has to do with the idea about what reform means. Is it a checklist? Are we looking at addressing these 52 points of information, these 52 correctives assigned by a court? Does that, the sum total of reform, checking the box on those and saying, okay, we're done with that, out the window, we're moving on from there? Or is it building out lasting, meaningful um, correctives and checks and balances in the institution? I don't think Oakland has yet accomplished that. I think a lot of good work has been has been done, but I think that we're still looking for the best shape of that post consent decree. And again, I don't think one individual is the solution to this. Um, I, it can't. I'm sorry, it can't be answered as a yes or no question. <laughs> in my, I watch every single police commission meeting. I read all their agenda materials. I follow the police commission extremely closely. That board is is hugely important in terms of the, the future of policing in Oakland. It will be the oversight mechanism once the federal monitor is long gone. And yes, Michelle Phillips is the first inspector general, and her job is essentially to oversee the department, prove in a sustainable way Oakland can police itself. Um, she's been on the job for well less than a year. I it's it's hard to say you know what she's going to do, how she's going to perform. And I, what I will say is the police commission um, and its investigative agency, um, they're still working out a lot of bugs um, that it's still, they've, they've had a very difficult time, even though they've been established since about 2017, they're still trying to figure out how to do their job. Um, so yeah, I, I, I don't think anytime soon that institution is gonna be like, you know, where the buck stops for accountability, but it's part of the process for sure. Well, Darwin, Von Graham, Ali Winston, thank you so much for allowing me to, um, to ask you some questions about the writers come out at night. Y'all go get this book. Um, this is 
uh, again, it's not just policing, it's the history of the place where we live. Um, and I want to thank the viewers at, um, at home or wherever you are on the screens and um, yeah, thank the Commonwealth Club. Thank you both. Thank you, Alice.